and the preservation at the same time of individual liberty and security. These questions have been debated since the very beginning of the Republic. This is a time for debate. These issues are hard realities, and they must be faced. Tonight, in a limited way, I shall attempt to illustrate my thesis by reference to situations in the international field. To note again the well-known policies we have followed since World War II, some of their contradictions and some modest suggestions for the future. Every year since World War II has been dark with danger. Berlin, Laos, Cuba, and now in Vietnam, along this war in which our country has participated since the revolution. Vietnam has become the most important and the greatest concern of our country. The administration, the Congress, and our people are troubled, but few agree on how to solve the problem. Some insist on a total and speedy military victory. At the other extreme, others plead for an end to the war and for peace at any price, and between there's a wide spectrum of views. The war in Vietnam will, I believe, cause us to re-examine our foreign policy, the division of power and responsibility between the Congress and the President, and the relative importance of our responsibilities in world affairs and for progress and justice at home. What we do in Vietnam will have its impact on all these questions. And I hasten to say that I listen with, will listen with a great deal of interest to the suggestions of my colleague, Senator McCarthy, because of his long experience in this field and particularly because of his the suggestions in the book which he has just been published. I believe our country is facing a most difficult test of national maturity. The principle laid down by our founding fathers, principles that thus far have endured the strains inherent in building a nation, the growth of a diverse population from many ethnic or origins, the waste of natural resources attending industrialization, the change from a rural society to an urban civilization, the impact of war, and now the new turmoil and discontent in our society. Since 1945, it seems to me that we have followed three basic concepts of foreign policy. They are, in my view, internationalism, containment of the communist bloc, and support for the development of the emerging nations as a means of assisting in the creation of a democratic and peaceful society in the world. At times, they have contradicted each other. They contradict each other in Vietnam, and now they impose the necessity of clarification. I would like to re review briefly these approaches and their sometime contradiction as they have developed since 1945. In the period which followed World War II, there was hope that the recurring struggles of the great powers from their competing ambitions could be restrained or at least accommodated with the help of an international concert of nations. It was the hope that through the United Nations, the disputes and problems of the world states would be debated, acted upon, and more rationally solved than ever before. Many policymakers thought that conventional war was no longer a serious threat and that the United States without ambition and possessing a monopoly of nuclear weapons could deter major aggression. Thus, internationalism became a cornerstone of our foreign policy. Our armies were disbanded and our wartime alliances allowed to lapse. But what was viewed in the United States and the West as a new assurance of world stability was considered by Stalin's Soviet Union as a major and successful step in its struggle with Western bourgeois capitalist nations. Until the Second World War, there had been no significant expansion of communist power, but the collapse of Nazi Germany 
brought the armies of the Soviet Union into Central Europe. The crises in, Turk in Iran, the fall of Czechoslovakia, the near collapse of Greece and Turkey, and the threat to a weakened Western Europe, threatening our security, challenge this hope and policy of basing United States security on the United Nations or upon a concert of nations. George Kennan described this development. He said, we, are sl we were slow to realize the dangers of this development, but once it had occurred, and it occurred partly with our blessing, we had, I think, little choice but to accept it. The alternative was to pile another great war onto the one we had just finished fighting. I do not think anyone in the world wanted to see that happen. I regarded the Sovietization of Eastern and Central Europe as part of the price that we paid for the ability to defeat Hitler in the war. The UN remains a necessary organization, but the United States felt impelled to protect itself and its weakened allies by the policy of containment, framed to meet the pressure of the Soviet Union. And that pressure was felt. I remember 1951, when I was in Europe at, at, the, one of, at the NATO meetings, when NATO was being organized, and with those leaders of those days, uh, just as they, as, a, as there as a helper, that there was a keen fear that the Soviet Union might uh, strike against Europe at any time. So as early as 1956, it became clear that the Soviet Union had no abstract devotion to the ideal of internationalism. Its attitude then, as it is now, was essentially pragmatic and tactical. The United States progressively entered into a wide reign of bilateral and multilateral mutual security agreements designed to contain the Soviet Union on the economic side, the Marshall Plan, and programs for the developing nations while reflecting the economic necessities of the world, and I believe our humane instincts, were established also as aids to contain Stalinist expansion. The nuclear deterrent and the development of the Strategic Air Command reflected the military aspect of this program. In retrospect, I think we can say that the policy of containment worked in its time. There have been no further Soviet advances in Europe, and the Soviet Union is keenly aware of the capability of our nuclear and military deterrent. But obvious limitations to a broad policy of containment have developed. In some countries, the United States has supported unstable military or political dictatorships, primarily because they were anti-communist, and even though they were bitterly opposed by their people. Castro's overthrow of the U.S. supported corrupt Batista regime and the establishment in Cuba of a strong pro-communist, anti-American government, 90 miles from our shores, brought home, I believe, the necessity of developing a new policy toward peoples, whether of colonial, former colonial areas, or of traditional states who are demanding their own revolution to satisfy their just demands. The emergence of vigorous nations like India, the United Arab Republic, Algeria, and Indonesia, and the forceful in entry of communist China upon the world scene, the breakup of the communist monolith that made it clear that containment as a policy is capable of meeting only a part of the problems which the United States faces in foreign affairs. The second and important change in world affairs was the emergence of the newly independent countries of Asia and Africa. Fifty-eight new nations have formed since 1945, and the United Nations has grown in membership from 51 to 122. Steadily across these continents, 800 million people have become independent. <coughs> Great advances in health have caused death rates to fall, but since agricultural production has not kept up 
With population growth, much of the world remains in constant danger of famine and starvation. A technology, technology which seems to advance at a geometric rate is rapidly separating the rich and poor nations. But at the same time, literacy and communication and a new awareness of the possibilities of development have raised the expectations of their people. And instability has accompanied the dynamic of change. Since 1961, regimes both backward and progressive have been overthrown. In Latin America, 22, 12 in the Near East, and 11 in Asia. During the long struggle of these new nations for independence, the United States gave assistance. And since political independence has been achieved, we have provided extensive economic aid. Yet deep misunderstandings about our purposes continue to disturb our relations with these new nations. In this era of freedom, the United Nations States, because of its association and alliances with former colonial masters, has inherited many of the resentments against Western imperialism. We have probably exacerbated these resentments by our criticisms of nationalism, of neutralism, or non-alignment, as some nations, such as India, term their policy. For we have found it difficult to understand how free people whom we have helped should stand apart from the struggle which we have believed may decide the ultimate freedom of the world. At the same time, the Soviet Union's policy and tactics toward these countries has been marked by a degree of flexibility unknown during the period of Stalinist preoccupation with Western Europe and the United States. It has directed its military and economic aid carefully to countries and areas which it considers most important for its objectives. And the Mideast crisis gives us a most recent example. Hundreds of native leaders in the Asian, Africa, political, industrial revolution have been brought to the Soviet Union for training. And Ru Russia has initiated many cultural exchanges designed to bring the two worlds into friendly association. <coughs> And we cannot doubt that the mystique of communist planning and its record of rapid economic program, although accompanied by repression, holds appeal to countries that feel they must get ahead. I believe that our policy in the future must recognize that in the long run, we cannot prescribe the shape of the government and society of these newly independent countries. The peoples of these countries will have their revolution, whether peaceful or violent, and determine their own future. We can take comfort from the fact that the desire to be independent from domination, our domination, or from the domination of any country, ought to lead them to resist the blandishment of the Soviet Union and China. And upon this rock, communist aggression, whether open or subversive may break. We must recognize that the, that the policies of other countries are theirs as we would like for them to understand that our policy represents our interest because the approach of each nation to world problems is conditioned by what each regards as essential to its own national well-being. We must recognize also the limitations on our ability to influence the form of their governments, their societies and culture. We can help through effective economic assistance and the expansion of trade. We can support their instruments and institutions of international law and order. Best of all, we can give an example at home. We hope that these emerging peoples will choose democratic values. In the long run, the choice will be theirs. The war in Vietnam has brought into focus the influence and direction of these policies we have followed, their strength and also their contradictions. Because of the contradictions, it, is, it seems difficult to understand our objectives in Vietnam. Which of these main doctrines I have discussed apply? 
Is our purpose to contain China? Or is the escalation of the war bringing us closer and closer to a major war with communist China? Are we keeping the peace of the world by punishing aggression in the spirit of rational internationalism? Or are we contributing to the breakdown of peace and the increase of violence throughout the world? Is it our purpose to oppose a classic war of communist national liberation initiated by North Vietnam and supported by communist China and the Soviet Union? Or are we opposing an indigenous struggle for national independence? Is it our purpose to help develop the economy and strengthen the social structure of Vietnam? Or are we destroying the economy and, and the possibilities of a life for them? The answers are not simple. I would suggest that we're doing all of these things. And a sober look at the ledger would indicate that the total of these conflicting approaches has not, has not been a successful involvement. But out of the tragic impasse of Vietnam, the United States has the opportunity to rethink and perhaps reorder its policies in the light of new and not altogether harsh realities. I hold uh, that the first imperative is for the United States to continue to take the initiative, even at risk, to bring the war to a close. This is the reason that I have urged for two years since the bombing began in 1965, as I did yesterday in the Senate, <coughs> that the United States uncondition unconditionally cease the bombing of North Vietnam. It is the indispensable condition for negotiation which has been asked for North Vietnam again and again. One cannot guarantee that it will succeed, that negotiations will ensue, but we cannot know that it will fail until tried. It is correct that the cessation of bombing and the restriction of the fighting to South Vietnam involves risk. But I believe that if negotiations do not immediately ensue, that our vast array of weapons concentrated in the South for the support of our fighting men, and at the point where supplies and men from the North enter South Vietnam <coughs> can better protect our men than is the case today. For since the beginning of bombing, the flow of men and weapons from the North has increased, and our casualties have grown larger and larger. But above all, de-escalation is the course to a ceasefire, negotiation, the resumption of the Geneva Conference, the settlement of the war. This is surely what is best for Vietnam, for the United States, and for the world. As a result of our increasing involvement throughout the world, it is necessary that the Congress should re-examine its responsibilities and duties with respect to the development of foreign policy. It should take a more active and responsible part in the consideration, debate, and advice respecting proposals made by the President and the executive branch of our government. The division and the areas of cooperation between the two branches are not always clear, but the responsibility to search them out is clear. An opportunity has been presented to the Senate by the introduction of Senator Fulbright's quote, sense of the Senate resolution, unquote, proposing that a national commitment is not made unless for the joint action of the executive branch and the Congress. I'm not sure yet that this is a precise statement in every respect, but I believe that it would be well to assert that the assignment of troops <coughs> to the territory of another state, which holds always the possibility of the progressive involvement of our men in fighting and war, as has occurred in Vietnam, should not be ordered except with the approval of the Congress. There are constitutional powers of the President which are, well, which are recognized. The power to use our forces reasonably to protect American life and property. The power to respond to an attack upon our troops or upon our land. Perhaps the power to move troops uh, to a point 
uh, where danger is imminent. But what I am talking about is the assignment of troops to a foreign territory where we are not engaged in assistance of another country and where gradually our forces become involved and there is a progression into war. I'm afraid in the case of Vietnam, this occurred through a period of 10 years and enough, not enough attention was given to it either by the Congress or by the executive branch. And finally, we find ourselves engaged, as I've said, in the longest war since the re resolution. It seems to me that such a resolution, even though it could not bind the president legally or constitutionally, would be a reasonable restraint and would give uh, attention uh, to the responsibilities of both the President and the Congress. I have referred before to our limitations and our capabilities in assisting other nations to achieve stable, independent governments and societies, which we, and which we hope will then adhere to democratic values and world order. There are other problems which we are constantly considering and debating in the field of foreign policy and which look and reach toward a peaceful era, or at least the one of order and law in the world. And one problem is whether the United States should continue its efforts to resolve its problems with the Soviet Union and the communist states, or at least seek some accommodation of these problems, and whether any agreement with the communists can be reliable. The problem is essentially more fundamental as it is a question whether we will always be destined to rely upon military power. It is understandable that concern over the Soviet Union's unchanging purpose of world acceptance of its ideology and its growing nuclear power have led some to assert that there is no auxiliary to the exclusive reliance on power for our protection and for our efforts toward peace and, as they say, victory over communism. It is clear that many consider negotiations, participation in the United Nations, foreign aid, and expanded trade of little value. I believe uh, on examination it is a policy which strip bare relies on the assurance of the nuclear deterrent or on war itself. No one, of course, can prove they are totally wrong until there is concrete evidence of communist peaceful purposes, we must maintain, at whatever cost, and we will, a superior military power, and will use it if our security and freedom are at stake. But I would argue tonight that in addition to maintaining this power, we have the duty to explore ever reasonable alternatives to force. For despite its difficulties, this course is the mandate of our self-interest, of our national character, and our respect for law. Many of our people are tired of foreign aid, and I think uh, I am at times, and, and it adherence to the United Nations. But I do not believe we can desert them. And in fact, uh, we must, I believe, add to this list expanded trade. In our harshest self-interest, I do not see how we can talk about winning ultimately over communism without war if we abandon the means of association with other countries or efforts to strengthen underdeveloped countries and to create, difficult as it may appear, a system of freedom and law throughout the world. A field which our government through four administrations has tried to develop alternatives to power and the ultimate danger of a thermonuclear war is that of negotiations with the Soviet Union respecting nuclear control and disarmament. No great progress has been made, but negotiations should continue. The issue of whether it is possible to work out an effective nuclear control and disarmament agreement which would better serve the interests of the United States and its national security than a continuation of the arms race can only be resolved by the painstaking process of negotiation. Only in this way can it be determined whether the common interests of the United States and the USSR are sufficiently strong to outweigh the interests which divide them. It is doubtful, I believe, that even the Soviet Union 
wants a thermonuclear war, and this gives us an opportunity for success. Whether obstacles can be overcome, an agreement reached that will enhance rather than detract from our national security remains to be seen, but we must not prejudge the effort. The war in Vietnam has brought into issue a very deep question, whether to use our vast power, which we can use to destroy a nation, or to exercise the restraint, which is a basic premise of our constitutional framework and our free system. Hamilton, Jefferson, and Madison were aware of the necessity to use power. They recognized that it is sometimes required to limit some individual freedoms for the greater good, but always parallel with that recognition, was, it, was their recognition of the dangers of the use of unprincipled power. In 1788, Madison in the Federalist Papers, number 41, discussed this question of power in general. But speaking of military power, he warned through an allusion to the classical past of the perspective and the judgment required to use such power with caution. He said, the veteran legions of Rome were an overmatch for the undisciplined valor of all other nations and rendered her mistress of the world. Not less true is it that the liberties of Rome proved the final victim to her military triumphs. Madison's perspective of 180 years ago is relevant now. Grotius held that broad principles of justice and morality applicable to persons and states were derived from natural law, the dictate of right reason which points out that a given act, because of its opposition to or conformity with man's rational nature, is either morally wrong or morally necessary. <clears throat> Looking ahead, I think that we must take counsel from the past, from mistakes we have made, from a good judgment in the past, and I think it has largely prevailed, and decide to what extent we can use the great power we have and, and try to determine that point where it becomes an unprincipled use of power. For after all, our system is distinguished from other systems in history, and I think particularly the communist system, because we do believe, or we say that we believe, in a moral order, and that these first principles exist. And if they do not seem to prevail, it is the continuing effort of all of us to make them effective. It gives purpose to our lives and sustains the hope of peace and justice. Fifty years ago, great Justice Holmes said in a speech, I have no belief in panacea and almost none in sudden ruin. I believe with Montesquieu that if the chance of battle has ruined the state, there was a general cause at work that made the state ready to perish by a single battle. I do not believe our country will perish by a single battle or any, or any battle, but I believe that in our, at home, in our actions at home, that the example of this country, the example of freedom, of justice, to all its citizens is the greatest use of our power throughout all the world. And in the world itself, the use of our power must be rational and unprincipled. And principled. Thank you. And now, my friends, the distinguished senator from the state of Minnesota, the Honorable Eugene J. McCarthy. Senator McCarthy. Oh, all right. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Well, Mr. Dietrich and my colleague, uh, Senator Cooper, and members of the faculty and students of Ball State University, 
I think we ought to explain to you that we don't have senators traveling in pairs now. Uh, that's a practice that's followed by the Russian Secret Service, and it used to be followed by the religious orders of America before the emancipation. Now they travel singly. I thought this might be a kind of a consensus politics. There are some senators who travel together and debate each other. Uh, they, they get to be like county seat wrestlers. One wins one night, and the other wins the next, and they, they get to know each other's falls and each other's holds. But Senator Cooper and I are, are traveling pretty much together and, and uh, on the same side of uh, most of the foreign policy issues. It's, with reference to some matters, you almost need a card now to tell the Democrats from the Republicans, and even the hawks and the doves are getting a little bit confused. They have um, the doves are beginning to soar a little bit, and the hawks are flapping their wings. Uh, we expect some resolution of that. I'm going to talk to you about the role of the Senate in the field of foreign policy uh, in a somewhat procedural way, I suppose, uh, but with reference to some of the special problems to which Senator Cooper has made reference. The Senate is a as, as we say regularly in the Senate, it's a, a unique body. It's an unusual legislative body. It's the only one, so far as I know, that's under any constitutional imperative in any country in the world to give advice. Uh, others just take it for granted, but we're compelled to do it by the Constitution. Uh, we, we think the President has read only that part about consent sometimes. Uh, we're trying to restore the double responsibility of the Senate, particularly with reference to foreign policy. But what sometimes seems to be a confused action on the part of the Senate and a kind of heedless and indefinite uh, proceeding is in part a reflection of the way in which the Senate was constituted, because in it uh, the men who drafted the Constitution tried to reconcile all of the major conflicts that took place at the Constitutional Convention. The question of the large states versus the small was resolved somewhat with the Senate uh, supposedly representing the small as well as the large. Uh, the division of powers over legislative matters involved a sharing between the House and the Senate. Controversy over the courts resulted in a compromise in which the Senate was called upon to confirm appointments to the courts, whereas the President nominated them. And in the critical field of foreign policy, perhaps the most important and significant compromise was worked out, that in which it was held that the Senate particularly should participate in major foreign policy decisions uh, principally through the ratification of treaties, which in 1789 was a reasonably effective way of determining foreign policy, and also through the ratification of ambassadors and secretaries of state. Things have changed considerably since 1789. We can, we can get ratification in the Senate of treaties that are well, so far reaching that they don't affect people. Uh, Outer space is, is an area in which it's quite easy to get the Senate to act. But when it comes to a question of having a Russian consulate in Cleveland, Ohio, at that point all kinds of doubts and reservations arise in the Senate. We're reasonably successful where there are nothing but animals, especially birds, uh, as at the South Pole. But when you move into the real areas of political decision, uh, where the real controversies take place more and more, I don't call it usurpation, but by the very movement of events, uh, decisions made at international conferences and by executive agreement, and modifications or actions taken under rather comprehensive treaty arrangements have come to be the prevailing mode of making decisions in foreign policy. But while all this goes on, the Senate remains with a very clear responsibility in the field of foreign policy. And I think it's our special challenge in the Senate primarily, although it's a matter of concern to the country, that we give attention to developing some new procedures and some new understanding so that this, what I think is a clear constitutional intent, can be realized. It doesn't necessarily mean that the foreign policy of the country will be better, but at least it will be more constitutional, and there's something to be said for that. But I think in addition to it, as we move into a very difficult area, calling for really not so much intellectual commitments on the part of the country, because Many of the problems with which we deal don't lend themselves to any kind of very clear settlement or determination, but they move us up to a point where we're called upon really to make a commitment in, in hope, a kind of moral commitment in keeping with the traditions of this country. And when you reach that point, it's not up to the President alone to make the concession or the judgment. 
and really not up to the Senate alone, but you hope somehow that whatever the mystique is by which the will of the people in a critical issue or a critical issue such as some of those which confront us, however this may be manifest, that line will be established. And so this, I think, is a, is, is a basic, almost a, a kind of philosophy or philosophical consideration which is at, at the base of the somewhat cursory and a rather disorganized debate that's going on in the Senate, not just in the Senate, but also around the country. Part of the difficulty is, of course, that the Senate, I suppose, is the last primitive society in the world. We, uh, we follow all of the practices that were really first noted at the beginning of society. We, we have great respect for seniority. Uh, that sometimes gets in the way. Uh, uh, occupancy is a great right in the Senate. Uh, if a man has an office, he can't be displaced. It's, it, this goes back to the cavemen. Uh, we uh, really believe in trial by ordeal. That's the ultimate uh, procedure for settling an issue in the Senate. We call it the filibuster, but uh, in, in earlier times it was a question of who had the, the greater endurance. And many difficult questions ultimately don't lend themselves to rational uh, solution, but lend themselves to some kind of settlement on that basis. And finally, we reserve to ourselves, I think, there's a, there's a kind of contest between us and the columnists now, but in every society you have to have somebody that it might be the high priests or it might be the medicine men, it might be the oracles, but you have to have some institution that renders the ultimate rash judgment. And we're holding out rather strongly in the Senate for that, uh, well, fulfill what we think is our obligation. Uh, since the end of World War II, there's been, in this field of foreign policy and foreign policy decision, a, a, a growing restlessness in the Senate, uh, concern over the concentration of both responsibility and power in the executive branch of the government, and a number of devices have been recommended and proposed and given some consideration by way of redressing somehow or the imbalance or restoring a kind of balance. In 1952, uh, this restlessness took the form of the Bricker Amendment, which received a really very little attention. It, it deserved, I think, somewhat more serious deliberation than it did receive. But it was set aside largely because it, was, it had become an instrument for the isolationists, and they were not so much concerned with the sharing of power to make decisions and the sharing of responsibility for foreign policy between the executive and the Congress, but rather with setting up machinery which would practically eliminate any kind of initiative in the field of foreign policy. It was also, of course, too far-reaching and to some extent also was, I think, not unconstitutional, contrary to the Constitution in that it involved the House of Representatives somewhat more intensively than I think the Constitution intended. In 1954, there was a short-lived effort to bring the Central Intelligence Agency under uh, somewhat uh, better congressional control. Uh, that uh, effort flourished for a short time and then was defeated. But from that time on, for nearly 12 years, the criticism was uh, well, rather spasmodic and, and most of it was peripheral. I suppose there are a number of reasons as to why that might have taken place. Uh, this was a period during which there was great preoccupation with the efforts to put through the Congress a, a whole body of legislative proposals which had been the subject of political controversy, of campaigns, of debate in the Congress for almost 20 years. And finally, in the 88th and the 89th Congresses, uh, we did act on a comprehensive program for education. We acted on the medical care bill. Uh, we acted... Uh, on civil rights. Uh, we acted to repeal the national origins provision of the Immigration Act and went beyond that to at least to, to attempt to do something about almost every problem of uh, crime and ignorance and poverty and even ugliness, which didn't really leave us much more in the way of a legislative program. This about exhausted the legislative possibilities. And so we began to turn to our other responsibilities, including the courts, but also looking to our responsibilities in the field of foreign policy. And the first open effort was 
an attempt on the part of the Foreign Relations Committee to have members of that committee included in the committee of the Senate, which is supposed to exercise some kind of oversight on the Central Intelligence Agency. That effort was made in 1966. It was not successful, or at least not formally successful. But early in 1967, a concession was made, and three members of that committee are, are now included in the committee, which does watch over, to some extent, the operation of that agency. Now, the arguments, of course, I, I think were beyond reputation. We held that this agency had become much more than a simple intelligence gathering agency and much more than a simple intelligence operation. That it was clear, particularly from Cuba, that the recommendations of the agency had great weight in determining what our policy might be. So it had become a policy forming, or at least a, a policy formation instrument. And in addition to that, it had taken on, in many areas, responsibilities for the execution of foreign policy. So on both counts, we felt that the Senate and the Senate acting through the Foreign Relations Committee had a clear obligation to exercise somewhat more careful supervision over this instrumentality for several reasons. One, we were concerned it might be doing things which were not even authorized by the executive branch of the government. We were also concerned they might be doing things authorized by the executive branch of the government, but which were of such a nature that the decision to perform or not to perform should have involved some kind of concurrence from the Senate itself. And thirdly, we were concerned uh, as to whether or not, assuming that everything it did was right and properly authorized, uh, whether it was really an efficient and an effective agency of the government. Secondly, we raised questions early this year and last year too about the distribution of arms to particularly the developing countries of the world. We raised questions about the distribution of arms to both India and Pakistan. We raised questions about the distribution of arms in the Middle East and also in Latin America and in a more limited way with reference to Africa. This was not just a case of, of our being for disarmament or against arming these countries because uh, each one, or at least each area, deserved to be treated as a separate case. Uh, we were concerned as to whether or not in certain cases armed sales or gifts or grants uh, should have been approved. But in addition to that, there was really a question of procedure, I suppose you'd say a theoretical question or a constitutional one. And it began to appear as though the Pentagon had also become a kind of force in foreign policy and that it had developed to a point where its operations were almost self-generating. The drive to establish a military presence in every, almost every country in the world. The desire to have our weapons and instruments of war uh, held by the military of the various countries of the world on the grounds that uh, this gave us control, at least to some extent, over their military operations. And then they finally added to this the argument that this was good for the balance of payments. And this is a very compelling argument for some members of, of the Senate. It was, I think, particularly pointed on the question of sale of wheat to Russia back in 1963 when those who were opposed to selling wheat to communists were on the other side torn by their desire for gold. The Russians had in mind to pay us in gold. This was a very difficult test. And I, I suppose I should say I regret to say that they settled for gold uh, despite their deep ideological feelings. The question as to whether or not the Pentagon had become an active force in determining foreign policy and even in executing it. And there's cause to worry because there's, there's great force in the Department of Defense with uh, a budget of roughly $75 billion and with its men and supplies scattered over the entire world. And I think that any time that you, you have something as, as big as that without a big war to fight, that military men like others with vocations, if, if they're not called upon to exercise their vocations, they tend to become what they would have been if they hadn't heard the call. And so we find in the Department of Defense everybody starting to be what he would have been. Uh, some of them wanted to be politicians. Uh, they worried us most. Um, 
Some of them wanted to be diplomats and begin to conduct foreign policy. Uh, some of them turned out to be retailers and developed the PX, which is uh, really the greatest distribution system in the world today. All, all developed within the Department of Defense itself. Uh, some of the others are rather obvious. They became scientists, which is well and good. They became uh, educators, uh, which is all right. And, and we found recently that there were a number who wanted to be bankers. Uh, and uh, in, in the last foreign aid bill, we, we tried to cut down a little bit on their... They were beginning to run a kind of Federal Reserve system for arms sales all around the world. And all of it coming really out of this kind of natural drive, it's, 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 a, it's a good American drive, but almost inevitable in a Defense Department which is as powerful and as diversified and is permitted to, to spread really, uh, well, I, I permitted to spread, I, I suppose that's right, uh, into all of these fields. In any case, we felt that it had moved too strong into the field of foreign policy and that either directly or indirectly, we ought to attempt to put some limitation upon it. And we did in the foreign aid bill this year. The third effort we made was to set a limitation upon the number of countries to which foreign economic aid might be given. Well, that appears to be a somewhat irrational way to approach uh, this kind of limitation, and I think that's right. Uh, the, I think the basis of that action was an argument made by Secretary Rust with reference to Vietnam when he was giving all possible reasons for our being in. He included one, which was that we had given economic aid, and consequently this, this involved an approval, and because we had that interest, we had to proceed to include military action in support or in defense of, or in continuation, however you describe it, of the economic aid that we've given. Some members said, well, if economic aid is the prelude to military intervention, then let's cut down on the number of countries. Well, the secretary charged us with being irrational, and when he was asked whether he would prefer to have us act rationally, and not just set a numerical limitation, but tell him which countries he could aid, he said he would prefer to have the irrational. And we're proceeding in a kind of limited irrationality now with reference to the economic aid program. And finally, coming out of these three or four efforts, uh, recently, this year, Senator Fulbright introduced the resolution to which Senator Cooper referred generally known as the, as the commitment resolution. Uh, basic question of who makes commitments or who has the mandate to make commitments or who really has the right to pledge uh, not just our military and economic strength but even to pledge our national honor. As some spokesmen have said, we have done in, in Vietnam. Those of us who were involved in the decision to well, we to introduce the resolution, and those of us who came in after it was introduced, uh, hoped that it might be the basis for a, a very thorough and scholarly inquiry uh, into this whole question of the relationship of the executive branch of the government, particularly to the Senate, in foreign policy. And we anticipated some opposition and some criticism, some question from the administration, but I think we genuinely hoped that uh, they would come in with a, a somewhat orderly and restrained analysis of the problem and probably make some recommendations or an indication that they would somehow try to work out procedures whereby the Senate particularly could be more directly and deeply and effectively involved in the determination of foreign policy. Well, it did not go quite that way. The first witness was Professor Barta, who gave a standard academic analysis of the problem, and he was followed by the Under Secretary of State. Mr. Katzenbach, and when he testified, some of us felt that it was later than we thought. Uh, he, um, well, we've been somewhat uncertain as to what his role in the State Department was after he'd moved there from the Attorney General's office. Uh, he had not done very much. He'd made a trip to Africa and had made several calls to Congress. Uh, urging people to vote for the foreign aid bill. <laughs> and many other people do that. That doesn't really distinguish you in the administration. But he did come up to testify on this. It became clear that his role was that of a kind of advocate, a kind of attorney general, really, for the State Department, making a legal case for 
whatever they had done and whatever they might wish to do. And really declaring that Congress had no really effective role and really there was a question of whether we had a right to even be involving ourselves and worrying over this relationship and sharing of power and responsibility. He said that there was some constitutional power we had, which was to obstruct and distort the president's policies. Uh, we couldn't find that language in the Constitution, uh, <laughs> but this was the language, and this was the one power that he really attributed to us. We acknowledged that under certain conditions we can do it, but we had hoped for a somewhat really, uh, well, more restrained use of the language, believing that the Senate and the Congress has sometimes been constructive. Now, the horrible example they always give is that of the rejection of the League of Nations, but more recently it was because of the Congress that the Test Ban Treaty was kept alive for about eight years and finally acted upon. And I think that was significant. It was largely because of Congress that what we now call a Food for Peace program was kept alive and, and somewhat strongly forced upon uh, reluctant administrations and carried by the Congress since. Now, now, both of these are, I think, highly important elements of our foreign policy and our international program today. So that we may have power to obstruct and to distort, and sometimes we do. But we also have power to be most constructive and also most helpful. Mr. Katzenbach said the Constitution compels support from the Congress for presidential policies. This was also a questionable interpretation, which we attempted to challenge, but he did say there was really a great advantage if circumstances permitted the President and Congress to act together. It was our feeling the Constitution was somewhat firmer than that, that it was not a matter of, of waiting for happy circumstances which permitted the two to work together, but there was a positive order and demand that they do work together and that they share in the decision-making, even though it might be difficult to work it out. And then he said the president alone had the support of the administrative machinery. Well, no one had said it quite that bluntly before. We have accepted that the administrative machinery of the government is responsible to the Congress and to the Congress's actions and decisions as well as it is to the president. But this was the kind of argument saying, you know, you might as well let us have our policy because if you don't, we won't administer it. Well, I may be overstating his intent, but I'm not overstating his language. And I, I think it, it is important that we force them to be clear about their language. We've been a little disturbed in the Congress. A friend of mine made the comparison, said, you know, everything that the church has tried to give up in the last two or three years has been taken up by the executive branch of the government. Instead of <laughs> we backed off a little bit on grace of office and even on infallibility, but... Um, <laughs> You, you just can't leave powers like that lying around loose, we've discovered. They've been quick to pick it up, and, and, and most uh, holy wars have been kind of, those of the past have been rejected by the churches, but not by the Defense Department. And, and we move on down. This is another speech I don't dare give yet, but, but we, we finally concluded that even giving up Latin was a mistake because they're beginning to speak it in the Pentagon now. Uh, practically all the words they use to explain what they're doing are significantly of Latin origin. Words like escalation and, and pacification and rectification of boundaries, uh, 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 really a whole, they don't speak pure Latin, but it's about as pure as the English they speak. And, and so we are forced to, to challenge at that point. And finally, he quoted Thomas Jefferson. And at this point, even those of us who are rather limited scholars about the Constitution said, you just can't quote Thomas Jefferson as being in favor of a strong executive in the field of foreign policy. Well, I suppose the significance of this testimony by Katzenbach is that, that they really haven't given serious thought in the executive branch of government to trying to work out an accommodation, a device, a set of procedures whereby what I think very clearly was intended by the Constitution, a sharing of decision-making, a sharing of power, and consequently a sharing of responsibility as between the executive 
and the Senate particularly, but beyond that in certain areas with the entire Congress, including the House of Representatives. And so we move now in the year 67 and 68, and I suppose it'll take five or ten years. But I think the direction is set, and you will, I hope, understand what may sometimes seem to be obstructionism on the part of the Senate. We may sometimes be distorting the policies of the President, but that for the most part in that route, we are trying to work out this kind of right and proper and constitutional adjustment. Well, what does it mean in the long run? I, I suppose none of us can, can really know because we're in a new stage, really, of America's role in history. Until very recently, we, I think, quite properly could feel that we stood apart from history and that we could move in and out if we wished to, give it some direction, give it a, a, a push or hold it back, as we did in World War I and again in World War II, an influence from outside. But we've had to make this very difficult kind of adjustment in the years since World War II of not being able to withdraw, not being able to move it about as we wish, but having to acknowledge that we're a part of the movement of history itself. And having made that acknowledgement of, of trying to accommodate our, our strength and also our weakness so that we can be a genuine influence for good and as we try in our individual lives also to make the course of history a somewhat more constructive and a somewhat more productive one. And this, I think, is the, is the special nature of the problem in, in Vietnam. Uh, we moved into it believing that uh, we could really handle it rather easily, that we decided to do it and therefore uh, we could do it. And gradually we re realized that this was a, a different kind of involvement. And whereas the first decisions, the partial commitments, the limited commitments, I think were quite defensible, we've now had to move on to make what's really a hard historical judgment. It's not the simple problem we had in World War I of saying, are we satisfied that our methods are good? Or are we satisfied that, that the objectives we seek in this war are wholly desirable? And even in World War II, no problem about what our objectives were and the moral justification for them. And no very serious problems about the methods we used, either against the Japanese or against the Germans. And also we could satisfy ourselves in each of these cases uh, uh, in historical context, saying we can see the prospects of victory and we can satisfy ourselves that the cost of that victory will not be proportionate to the loss of life and property and general demoralization that goes with war. And this is the hard judgment we're called upon now to make with reference to Vietnam. And it, it's, it's my judgment that as we try to strike this kind of balance or work out this problem of proportion, that we are no longer able to make the moral case that what we may get with victory, if we can achieve victory, or what will be called victory, is no longer proportionate to the destruction of life and property, the great waste of moral energy which goes into that war, and the almost forced neglect on our part of other problems, both at home and abroad. I would conclude with the reference to an observation made by Toynbee in his, well, recent book, Senators, any book that's been written within the last five years we call recent, on Rome and Carthage, in which he says that Rome's victory over Carthage really resulted in the destruction of the Republic. Now, I don't see Vietnam destroying the Republic, but there is a comparison. He said that because of the great distraction of that war, Rome neglected its internal problems and internal changes, and also it failed to respond to the demands that were being made in the empire itself. And that consequently, a hundred years later, the Republic failed and the dictators took over. Well, it's within this kind of historical context, I think, that we in the Senate are attempting to make judgments today, and it's within this context, too, that uh, we're calling upon everyone, particularly everyone in the academic community, to attempt to make a judgment in that same context. At this time, there will be a period of questions from the audience. We request that you 
understand when you ask the question <coughs> if you have a horrible case of stage fright and don't wish to stand, ask your you know, I'm always neighbor to so stand with you. And if that doesn't work, we'll ask the entire auditorium to stand with you while you ask your question. We'll try to repeat the question that you direct, and if you'll specify the senator that you would like to answer the question, we'd appreciate that also. Questions from the audience, please. Question right yeah. here, yes. Yeah. How, do you, how do you define internationalism? Definition of internationalism, Senator Cooper. <laughs> I think I defined it, and, that, and I would define it in the sense I was talking about it. The change in what has been an isolation of the in this country. One way we have been, but where we have lived so much. The more recognition that the United States was a power in the world, and had to work to the form, it was engaged with a lot of influence and use it as a process of the other thing, concept that I have. Other questions? Yes, over here. intelligent man and uh, I, I think though that he's not so good on political advice he, he, gave, he gave military advice to several presidents I don't think he's very good on his political advice well I don't think there's anybody brainwashed about it you, you, you probably take the wrong judge you make the wrong take the make the wrong judgments about it that's all I can say about it but I, I think that's right that, that, uh, that I think the military made some bad judgments but it was it was under New and different circumstances, and that they they gave their honest opinions and recommendations to the to the president, uh, and uh, I I don't think that uh, that we've really been deceived. What you do is question their judgment, and and that's just as bad as if they you know in the long run if they're mistaken and making bad judgments, it's the consequence is just about the same as if they were misleading us. But, um, there had been I think a little bit of you know like sending Taylor and Clifford out. Uh, 
They were like house detectives. They weren't going to find anything the management didn't want found. And, 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 uh, and that's about what they reported. I mean, nobody was surprised at the report. It was, uh, it was just what we expected. Another question. Yes, back here. Well, I, ex I, I suppose that the North Vietnamese, to the extent that they, they know there's dissent and criticism over here, uh, take some heart from it. Uh, there's no indication, however, that they have uh, eased off. As a, you could reason that because of it, they ought to just back off and, and, and uh, let dissent take care of the problem. But they, they haven't shown any disposition to cut back on their military effort. Uh, you could say, well... Uh, they intensify it because they're so encouraged. They think they're going to win very quickly. But then you get into all kinds of complicated um, psychological explanations, which I think we've, we've really got too much of this going. And uh, this sort of thing would stop dissent of every kind. There are those who say the reason you got riots in the city is because Congress tried to pass a civil rights bill. So you can you can back up to absolute zero if you if you accept that thesis, which is clearly unproved and. When you, you realize that they're talking uh, about people who, who think in a different language, and even to communicate with them, you have to go from English to French to North Vietnamese and then back again, and then make one more translation from English to the language they talk in the, in the executive branch of the government. So that you, you run this thing through four translations, and, and, and there, there are bound to be some misunderstandings, I think. Uh, I, 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 I don't think there's a case, I guess, what I should have said to begin with without going around. But we, we feel obligated to speak and to criticize, even though it, it may give some consolation to the enemy. Yes, sir. Well, we've done it on the CIA to some extent. Uh, we uh, we did cut back on the on the uh, arms that they could grant in Africa and also in South America. Uh, we took away in the Senate the three hundred million dollar revolving fund that the Defense Department had to promote arms sales all around the world. Uh, these are pretty significant steps to take against the executive branch of the government. Uh, we did in the Congress move on one or two recommendations in the in the Defense Department, uh, 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 one having to do with the anti-ballistic missile defense a, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and one having to do with the Navy request for certain ships more recently. We ran a series of kind of educational television programs both last year and next year, which were a direct challenge to the executive's uh, position on foreign policy which is an indirect way to move. Uh, I, think that, um, uh, I think that another action similar to what you have in, in, in Vietnam would, would be met with a much greater restraint and, and I think even some procedural devices whereby the escalation of, of the war uh, might be prevented or, or, or slowed down. And I anticipate, even though the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, as the, as the President said, didn't give him any power that he didn't have, 
it gives him a, a debating advantage which he continues to use. Uh, I think Congress will be very slow to, to, to act on anything comparable to the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, even though it didn't, in fact, give him any power. So that there's no direct way to move. It's really what it calls for is a kind of accommodation. And it may, it may mean that we have to move to a quasi-cabinet system in which uh, either the Foreign Relations Committee or perhaps other members chosen from the Senate or the House uh, are formally involved in consultation on, on, on more intimate uh, decisions of foreign policy. Now, I don't see the system preventing this kind of development. We, we do it in, uh, on things like atomic energy. Uh, we do it on, uh, in several other areas of that, space, outer space. We, we select members who confer with the executive branch and really make the decisions uh, in, in, in camera almost. We could do the same thing in, in foreign policy. I don't know what will be in the platform. I think that um, it's a responsibility of both parties to raise the issue of Vietnam and the approach to peace in, in southeastern Asia as a part of the whole procedure by which platforms are developed and candidates are finally chosen at the convention. And uh, I, I, I think there'll be a strong representation at the Democratic convention, certainly for a, a a peace plank of some kind, of a policy, a different policy in Vietnam, and I think it may even bear somewhat on the selection of candidates or upon the position of candidates uh, who, are, who finally carry the, the banner of the Democratic Party. Follow-up question? Yes. Right back here, yes. John, are we mindful of the disapproval? Well, uh, was your question directed to yeah. the attitude of the Senate toward yeah. this? Yeah. Right? yeah. Is that it? That's How we feel about it. Yes, uh, I, I think uh, all of us know and read and discuss, talk about the attitude of other countries toward uh, the war in Vietnam, if that is what you've directed your question specifically to. Some people, some of our members and who visit the countries uh, adjacent to or in the area of Southeast Asia report that the governments of those countries, of course, support uh, the United States position in, in Vietnam. I've been in those countries myself. The, the governments, the people in the governments, some of those countries have told me that. I do not know whether that represents the attitude of the peoples of those countries themselves. We know, of course, that in uh, Africa, <coughs> other countries, there's resentment against our policy, and also in Europe. We're aware of that, and uh, we just got the problem is uh, we're there, and the problem is how to move toward uh, 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 negotiations and a settlement which will be reasonable and just to get out. Uh, I think we're all agreed on that. Uh, what we, Senator McCarthy has talked about tonight and what I alluded to in a more general way was the effect that this experience in Vietnam should have on the Senate, the House, and, and the Executive in avoiding as as we can with similar experiences. Yes, I, I, we're aware of what is said in other countries. Yes. 
Well, I don't really want to blame the RAND Corporation or the computers yet. I, I, I don't think the policies really originate there. The danger I see in, in the use of, of, of that kind of research group, and, and this is, is really, the, I think, the, the problem with Secretary McNamara, is that they, if you come to them with a proposition and say, can you program it, you know, like, let's take Moscow on Monday, they say, well, you give us 24 hours. And then they come back and say, we've programmed it. So you then don't ask a question as to whether you ought to really put it into effect or not. You're just so happy that they programmed it. You, 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 you approve of the programming instead of the program. And I think it gives a tremendous kind of feeling of, of power when you have something as, as impartial as a Rand Corporation inquiry or, or whatever other operations they use. It's, it's, it's as though you'd consulted the Oracle. And, and, and said it, the oracle said, you, you know, the, the Greek ships will burn, and uh, they don't always burn. Uh, this is the problem, I think, of the new computerized and programmed approach. It's not the or, or origin of the idea, but that any idea you give to them, they can, they can, you can give them contradictory ideas, and, and they, can, they can program them both. And this is really, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Time for two additional yeah, very questions. Helpful, yes, sir. Front row. It is the problem with that. What goals we can pursue in Vietnam and how Congress can implement the goals, Senator McCarthy and Senator Cooper. Well, it's kind of where we came in. I, I, I think that. Uh, that, uh, Senator Cooper stated quite clearly what steps he thought we should take, and, and they're not very different from what I've say what I recommended. Uh, uh, I've felt for some time that uh, we, we, we can't use unilateral withdrawal. Now we're talking about a concurrent unilateral withdrawal, which means that both sides would conduct some kind of unilateral withdrawal. Each would be different from the other. Uh, but they do it at the same time, which is different from bilateral, I guess. Uh, I have not of the opinion that, that just stopping the bombing will, uh, I, I see no fault in doing it, but I, I think that we, we unilaterally, uh, we hope concurrently, uh, that we should do more than that and, and begin to evacuate or, or to, to announce that there be no military action in some of the other areas in South Vietnam in the hope that these could be pacified. and. I think we're in a position of holding strong points that, uh, more effectively now, if you're concerned about the Chinese takeover of all of Southeast Asia and so on, with the strong bases we have in South Vietnam, which we didn't have at the beginning of the war, and also the strong base in Thailand. So that we're, we're in a position, I think, to give some ground and, and to test to see whether or not some kind of order or pacification uh, might not be achieved, rather than to continue to do what we've been doing and, and, and to intensify it, which seems to be the, which is the policy now in, in operation and which it seems to me is indicated for the future. And the Senate, we just do what we're doing, I think. We've, uh, we've raised questions and challenged and taken some political risks, and I think more and more members of the Senate and the House move to that direction, and as the campaign comes on, this is the this is the process, Ray. Really. There's no way to bring down a government in this country excepting uh, in an election year. And, and I think consequently this means that we've, we've got to give more and more attention to foreign policy decisions and, and issues uh, in election years and, and hope somehow that the domestic problems will take care of themselves. Senator Cooper, do you want to respond to the <coughs> question? Well, I, I think uh, in my talk I outlined my views. It's essentially to reduce the fighting. Some one of the parties has got to do it. We've proved our point that we cannot be driven out, and if we want to, we could do more. So I think that's known. And as, a, as the strongest uh, country, we can retract. I said bombing because that, I believe the bombing has caused the, the increase and in expansion of the intensification of the war. Retract, uh, confine it to South Vietnam, see if there is a response on the other side, either the stoppage or retraction or redu reduction of the flow of supplies and demand because they've, they've increased since we started bombing, 
see what the Russians would do. Uh, they have at times have talked as if they would like to see the war stop, uh, see if they would then continue to supply weapons to North Vietnam. And it, it's, even if there's not an immediate negotiation, it seems to me that's a reasonable way to stop and reduce the fighting, and eventually I believe it would end. Uh, all these wars have been settled by negotiations finally, except uh, World War II. As to our goal, it's up to, I, I think finally this will, if it's ever stopped, it'll go back to Geneva Conference. And the same rules and, and that were laid down that conference will have to be followed. That means that there'd be a reasonable time for these peoples in both North and South Vietnam uh, to, uh, to work, see what they could work out among themselves, but finally to be an election where they decide for the whole country, because it is one country. As I said, I hope that it would be a democratic country, but if it isn't, uh, it's a choice of their people. Uh, I, th I think they had 10 years. Uh, from the 19, well, from the Geneva Conference, certainly through them, there's a wonderful opportunity to, for the South Vietnamese government to institute reforms that could have gained the support of their people. They didn't do it. And no government in these emerging countries is going to hold the support of the people unless they give them reforms. Senator Cooper, Senator McCarthy, I'm sure that as we think and reflect and react to the ideas presented here this evening, there will probably be one idea, I think, that will emerge as this college emerges, we hope as a distinguished university, and that is that all points on the circumference of this world are seemingly equidistant from this university. In us, potentially every radii of the world begins, every diameter of the world runs through us, and perhaps in everything that we do at this university uh, can potentially create a totally new world geometry and perhaps even affect eternity, and perhaps even, as we have said before, finally come to that stage where we do have one world composed of one man, all men, one woman, all women, one child, all children. Thank you, Senator Cooper, Senator McCarthy, Miss Smith, and thank you, my friends. Good night.